so little is known about exactly how the brain works. But as we see in this, I'm going to use the word because it's been out there a lot, unprecedented times, uh, one of the interesting things is that alcohol sales are up 34%. Now, that's pretty high. I think it's even higher in the United States, over 200%. But it does show that many people, and maybe you're one of them, are reaching for a bevy to deal with the isolation and stress of these times. So what's going on there? What's happening? Uh, Let's introduce us to our guests today. Professor Andrew Lawrence is Head of Mental Health and Head of the Addiction Lab uh, at the Florey Institute of Neuroscience and Mental Health. Professor, good afternoon to you. Hi there, welcome. Thank you for your time. And then we also have Associate Professor Yvonne Bonomo, Director of the Department of Addiction Medicine at St Vincent's Hospital in Melbourne. Hello to you too. Hello there. Um, Let's um, um, get a a bit of a comment from both of you, if I can. And I'll start with you, Andrew. What is actually happening in the brain during times like this when we're we're thinking um, a bevy or a drink is a good thing? Well, I guess it's very complicated. A lot of things are happening. For people that are prone to uh, stress and anxiety, um, there's there's multiple issues. People that are maybe having had issues with alcohol in the past, if they, if they feel stressed, that can precipitate them wanting to reuse alcohol uh, uh, and, and, and relapse. But, but for other people that maybe didn't have an alcohol problem in the past, the, the stress and the anxiety of the current situation and the worry of the current situation causes, um, can cause alterations in, in certain brain chemicals. And, and paradoxically, acutely, alcohol can act... Um, in a way to reduce anxiety and to reduce stress, and people may be therefore use it as a coping mechanism. But the problem is, uh, long term, a heavy alcohol consumption has the flip side and can actually make someone even more anxious rather than less anxious. So it's a it's a real double edged sword. So acutely, it, it can work in that way to reduce anxiety levels, but in the long term, it will actually make them a lot worse. So my advice would be. Um, not to drink as a way to cope with stress or anxiety. Sure, have a glass of wine with your meal if you want to, but but don't use it as a coping strategy. Use other mechanisms as a coping strategy. That would be my advice. Yeah. Yvonne, what are we doing? What is there in alcohol or perhaps other substances that is helping us cope as such, as Andrew says? Well, as Andy um, alluded to, it's actually very complex and we only understand very basically what substances do, but essentially they, the different substances that people use, be that alcohol or other drugs, tend to affect the balance of neurochemicals in our brain. And so by affecting the balance, they help people to feel better in the short term. But again, as Andy alluded to, in the longer term, that en- ends up uh, being counterproductive. But certainly in the shorter term, it, it helps people feel less stressed or less anxious or indeed some people in isolation are feeling bored. And so when they're bored, sometimes they want to use substances to feel different. And again, it's all, it comes back to those uh, balance of neurochemicals within our brains that make us feel better. And does it actually bar- balance the neurochemicals in our brain or what does it do to give us that feeling? Well, euphoria that people feel or the feeling of relaxation or um, the feeling of well-being can't be pinned down to one particular neurochemical. Unfortunately, Sonia, for that easy, we'd all be um, using chemicals as we needed them for different situations. But it's um, more about the overall balance within chemicals in the brain that make us feel better, Mm. uh, feel less... uh, So we have excitatory chemicals and we have inhibitory ones and it's the balance of those that makes us feel, um, have that feeling of well-being. Uh, John's given us a call from Somerton Park. You were questioning the original statistics, are you, John? I'm just wondering if um, pubs and clubs and all other revenues are, are closed for someone to go and have a social drink. And I know myself that I'm not drinking anymore, but my point of sales is at the now the bottle because it's the only place you can really go to get um, yeah. to get a drink. So I'm just wondering if they brought those statistics into it. Yeah, well, that's a, that's a fair point. Um, Andrew, do you think we are actually drinking more or it's just that it looks like we're buying more because you're not getting the numbers from the pubs and clubs? 
Yeah, it's a good it's a good question. I mean, it could be that the you know the bottle shops have seen an increase in sales because, as as the caller said, the bars are shut and so they're going to the bottle shop mm. instead. I think the other thing uh, that we have to remember as well, though, is online. There's so many uh, outlets online there where you can order alcohol and have it home delivered. Uh, and so I think it's it's much easier nowadays, even in a lockdown type scenario, to to maintain a supply of alcohol relative to to illegal drugs, for example. So, Andy, let's talk about some of the short-term effects on the brains of consuming Mm -hmm. substances like alcohol or or other addictive substances. Let's start with short-term effects. Yeah, well, I mean, as as we said before, both myself and Yvonne, it's very complicated. It's it's, it's really a network effect, not an effect on a single single system because alcohol is a very uh, kind of, uh, a molecule that, that act, can interact with multiple systems, either directly or indirectly. And so what it, one of the things it's very good at doing, though, is acting uh, like a, like a, um, a sedative uh, acutely. So like a benzodiazepine, like Valium, it's almost like having a, having a glass of Valium to a large extent acutely because it has that, that same... It acts in the very same... Uh, on the same system that, that Valium acts on, and that's why... It helps relax people and helps calm people down and, and helps allay anxiety. Um, but obviously, if you consume too much of it, then it could send you off to sleep. But paradoxically, you don't sleep very well if your sleep is being induced by alcohol. Mm. So alcohol can cause sleep disturbances. And obviously, if you keep using high amounts of alcohol on a, on a, on a longer-term basis, it causes a wide range of um, uh, adaptations to, to the brain, to the way the systems in the brain operate, the, the, the strength of certain connections relative to others, and the levels of different uh, chemicals that are, are normally in balance that become very much out of balance. And that's why people have a withdrawal syndrome when they cease using as well. Mm. Yvonne, short term, uh, we're feeling good, as Andy describes, with those Valium type effects. Uh, Long term, what sort of impact uh, or effect uh, is alcohol and other substances having on the brain? Well, long term, you've got a change in the balance of neurochemicals in your brain. So that means that you're not thinking as well as you normally would. Your concentration is affected, your memory is affected, and even your general well-being becomes affected. And it's a mm-hmm. fairly subtle effect. So often, people don't realise that this long-term effect is creeping in till they take a holiday from drinking for a month, and then they say the, at the end of the month they feel so fantastic, and they realise how it's crept in into their um, usual state and they're not used to feeling uh, as well as they do when they're alcohol-free. And then even longer term, you start to see that people become wired differently and and even to brain damage. So that's if it's longer term, very much longer term and heavy, but you can see that there's this um, progression to more and more... Um, ill health with regards to alcohol. Let's assume there are people um, uh, that are, who are drinking more at this time and it's, you know, we've been in this for about a month. We've definitely got at least another month to go. If you're drinking more over a period of two months, is that likely to cause long-term damage if you go back to normal after after that period? Uh, hard to know. Depends on your genetics. Um, it depends if you have a family history of alcohol troubles. If it depends on your current physical state. So people with a fatty liver, for instance, will get an even more fatty liver and incur some damage that way. So, Sonia, I can't really answer that question with one answer because it really will depend on the individual. Mm. However, we know that people who um, drink over, say, two or three months quite heavily... Uh, are likely to have some impacts that should be reversible if they stopped drinking and if they didn't have pre-existing damage to any of their organs beforehand. So it's something Mm. to really consider carefully um, rather than just sort of letting go and saying, I'll just do this and whatever the consequences I'm talking uh, with um, uh, Professor Andy Lawrence from the Flory Institute of Neuroscience and Mental Health and also Associate Professor Yvonne Bonomo from St Vincent's Hospital from the Department of Addiction Medicine. Um, Andy, the um, Flory and St Vincent's currently have a a clinical trial underway about alcohol use disorder. Um, What are you trying to find or or, or achieve from this trial? Okay, so it's... 
so I get my I'm a basic scientist. I'm not a clinician. I'm not a clinician, and, and my my research goal has been over over many years to try and identify new therapeutic targets to help um, reduce drug and alcohol abuse, and particularly to help prevent relapse, for example. And uh, Back in 2006, we were the first group in the world to publish um, some findings that we made uh, showing that a particular uh, neurochemical in the brain was critical for driving the motivation to obtain and consume alcohol, and it turns out other drugs of abuse as well. The system is a complex system. It's involved in appetite regulation. It's also involved in uh, sleep-wake arousal states, and in fact, uh, we, we've shown, and many others have shown as well since our first showing, that, that it's critical for, for drug and alcohol use. Um, and we've identified the sites in the brain where it's acting to do that. Now, subsequently, a drug company called Merck developed a compound to target this system uh, and use it as a treatment for insomnia. And so it's registered for use in the USA, in um, Japan and Australia as a, as a, as a sleep, sleeping tablet, basically, to, to help. Uh, address insomnia. Now, if you remember earlier on, I said that um, alcohol people with alcohol use disorder typically have uh, insomnia or, or, at the very least, very bad sleep patterns as well. And so we're targeting uh, this two ways. We, we're targeting this system to, A, help restore a normal sleep cycle, a normal sleep pattern. That in itself should also help reduce relapse because sleep deprivation is a big risk factor for relapse. But we also know that targeting this system will, will also... Um, reduce the motivation to consume alcohol. If alcohol is consumed, it will reduce the amounts consumed and it will also reduce the craving associated with uh, wanting to use alcohol. And also, importantly, we think it will reduce the severity of withdrawal scores during uh, acute withdrawal from alcohol. So this is a trial inpatient in, uh, in Yvonne's Addiction Medicine Centre at St Vincent's where people come in to have a week detoxification and we're trialling them on this compound, and it's a double-blind placebo-controlled trial to see whether or not this intervention will assist with uh, their sleep patterns, will assist with uh, reducing the severity of their withdrawal scores, will reduce their craving and subsequent use of alcohol when they uh, go back out of hospital, back into the community. So the, the, the one uh, thing I should say as well at this point in time is that we've actually unfortunately had to suspend the trial due to the COVID-19 problem. So we had started and we were forced, the Ethics Committee made us suspend the trial due to the COVID problem. And so we will recommence the trial again just as soon as uh, we're allowed to by the um, yeah. ethical Interesting that you say that's the reason it's been um, uh, shut down at the moment. Because, Yvonne, I was going to ask you, do you think that there is any likelihood that if someone did feel that they were starting to recognise an issue with drinking or other addictions, that this current environment might see them uh, delay help because they don't think this is the right time to go to hospitals, for instance? Yes, and... That is definitely happening. We, we're seeing that happening. We're hearing that people are um, avoiding coming to the hospital or attending, um, seeing a health professional. would be to those people not to leave it because the sooner you act, the easier it is to get on top of these sorts of problems. Mm. Are you less likely to recognise you've got a problem the more you drink or take substances? I mean, see that, that switch flick? Uh, and it's likely to be a change in the brain, but I think it's also like just part of our human nature that we rationalise what we do, don't we, till suddenly we can't rationalise it anymore. So I think it's important for people to just um, check in on themselves and reflect on how much they're consuming or how much of that bottle of wine is, is going over what period of time and if it's uh, been consumed mm. too quickly, then see if you, if, if you can hold hold back on it but if not then it's time to seek help and well, there are it, online resources that can help make, make those first steps because there, there are quite a few texters who are suggesting that um, look I'm just drinking the same amount it's just that I'm drinking it at home rather than in a cafe restaurant pub or you know whatever um, so it's about being honest with yourself about what your behaviors are I guess at this point exactly. yeah, yeah. Yeah. yeah, and is there a gene which predisposes people to addiction, and is it specific to some substances more than others, or general? Asks one of our texters. Uh, there isn't no. one gene. Oh, 
Over to you, Andy. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say the quick answer is no. There's, there's no definitive marker gene that will uh, say you are or are not going to become uh, a drug addict or an alcoholic or what have you. There are um, there are vulnerability factors, but that's just an odds ratio. But there's yeah. nothing that's definitive. There, there is, interestingly, in, in the Han Chinese, a polymorphism, a, a, a change in a gene that's something that's expressed in the liver that's involved in metabolising ethanol, and that's actually a, project, a, a protective genetic mutation. So that's why, um, while you know, you, you find in a lot of Han, uh, Han Chinese people that there's not a big alcohol problem because they find it very difficult to metabolise, and so they become unwell very, very quickly. So that's a good example of a protective mutation. That, like I said, there are there are different mutations that will increase the odds ratio of, of one yeah. or other substance abuse problem, but nothing definitive. Good to talk with you both. Thank you for your time. Professor Andrew Lawrence, um, Head of Mental Health and Head of the Addiction Lab at the Florey Institute of Neuroscience and Mental Health, and also Associate Professor Yvonne Bonomo, Director of the Department of Addiction Medicine at St Vincent's Hospital.